Welcome back to Inside Politics. We're talking today, Dr. Thomas Swartz of Vanderbilt University. We're talking about the Russian invasion of Ukraine as it passes the sixth month into those hostilities. Uh, Dr. 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 Swartz, um, we're six months in, we're now in the seventh month of this war. Is either side really winning this? Or are we sort of in stalemate? Where are we? I, I think we're still in something of a stalemate, although the Ukrainians have now launched two offensives, one in the northeast, one in the south, that have had some impact. Uh, it, it, it seems, according to at least some of the sources that uh, I'm reading, the Institute for the Study of War, that they have had some effect. They've had some surprise in terms of their ability to capture some territory, and they have captured a, a, a modest amount of territory in the south away from the Russians. So they've had some success. I, I think it's still very modest. The Russia still occupies about one-fifth of Ukraine. So it's likely that um, uh, I think stalemate is still a better description than necessarily a momentum one way or the other. I think the Russians have retaken most, if not all, of the breakaway provinces in the Ukraine, the ones that had sort of been leaning pro-Soviet, mm -hmm. or, or pro-Russian, I should say. They, the Russians are now planning to have elections in that area to sort of make them officially part of Russia. Mm -hmm. Anything the Ukrainians can do to stop that? No, they really can't, and this is this is a, an aspect of it. They, the Russians had elections, for example, they did when after 2014 they did a plebiscite in Crimea, and honestly, that probably didn't uh, that probably did reflect uh, public opinion in Crimea at that time. In Luhansk and Donetsk, the two provinces you're talking about, there's a bit more of a mix there because so many of those who might have voted against Russian annexation have fled. So basically, it, even if the election were fair, which I I highly doubt it will be. It will probably show an overwhelming support for Russian annexation. I don't know if these Ukrainians are from the two provinces that you're talking about, but report, Russians have reportedly taken over a million Ukrainians yes. and basically uh, sent them to Russia. Yes. Uh, yep. Some things you sort of heard of off during the Second World War. Um, mm. Russia says that that's, Ukraine says that's not true, not, that the Russians are doing that, but the Russians say that's not true. Um, is this a war crime to do that? Um, the forcible transfer of populations is a war crime. Now, what the Russians will claim is that, of course, they're evacuating them for their own safety and or the fact that uh, some uh, people in those areas, which are traditionally more Russian-speaking and Russian ethnicity, actually wanted to go to Russia. So this will be, uh, even though the, 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 there are aspects of this that, that are would be considered a war crime, this will be one that would be very hard necessarily to prove in a court. A lot of talk early on in the war about war crimes being committed committed by both sides, at least accusations of that, um, that's kind of died off and is in part because the Russians are going ahead and have their own trials now. In fact, they're going to use one of the cities that they, they captured and actually put the POWs they captured there and make them the war criminals even though they didn't destroy the city. No. Um, I think that's, the, you know, what's interesting there is that the Ukrainians went really quite quickly after they retook territory, particularly around Kiev where they found mass graves, to begin trying uh, and setting up war crimes trials. Well, the Russians retaliated rapidly and they have these, uh, they have these uh, men from this particular Ukrainian regiment that fought in Mariupol and they're going to put them on trial. They've accused this group and there were nationalists in this group of being pro-Nazi and so they're going to stage this and I think for that reason the Ukrainians pulled back from their own um, uh, attempt to do trials at least for the time being and they'll wait it out. It was thought early on the Russians would win this war easily and quickly. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen and still shows no signs of happening anytime soon. Uh, why the Russians continue to do so poorly? Well, there's a lot of uh, thinking about that, and I think um, clearly the uh, the invasion itself was poorly planned and supplied because they expected the Ukrainian government to collapse. And I think this is a case of of, of, of essentially believing that you would not need the types of preparation for a full-scale military prep, uh, invasion. And so even some of the soldiers that the Russians sent were not told what they were going to be doing. So in that sense, they, they, they found, and then the other side of the story is not just that the Russians are doing poorly, it's that the Ukrainians fought and that the Ukrainian government did not, as the Afghan government, fle flee the country the way I think the Russians expected them to. So the combination of Ukrainian resistance and, and the, the training Ukrainian, the Ukrainians have gotten from and help from NATO, along with then poor performance by the Russians, I think at least goes somewhat to describing this.
Again, early on, the Russians uh, have lost a number of generals in this. Yes. Uh, is that a particular problem? Is the Russian army not built to where the non-coms and the enlisted men are able to step up when the generals are knocked out? Have the Ukrainians been trying to kill those generals because they see a weakness in the Soviet ar in the Russian army because of that? I think it's a bit of both. The, the fact that the, the, the non-com is not a particularly strong feature of the Russian army means the generals are more actively engaged and such, therefore, vulnerable. The Ukrainians have been benefited from um, NATO sharing of intelligence that has allowed them to target uh, the leadership areas of Russian forces and to be able to go after them. But I think this is also a fault of the Russian army, that it's in the situation where it uh, deploys its generals to the front lines. We've been talking about war crimes a lot. Uh, is killing generals uh, per se a, a war crime, or is that or is all fair in not just love, but in war, particularly if you're talking about killing people with arms? And, and no, they're combatants. Uh, I, I don't think, um, it, it, although it it may seem uh, that they're being targeted. It, uh, they are unlike unlike civilians. They are uh, they are in military uniform. They're engaged in the invasion. And therefore, I think subject to that uh, to to that vulnerability, and they can't. I don't think that would be a war crime. If we're likely to see any war crime tribunals, they're more likely to be held after the war, although, except for the one perhaps the Russians are doing right now. Yes, I think any type of real war crime issues will have to wait until the hostilities cease. And the with social media and all the electronic communications, it's now. Easy easier to document those than it has mm -hmm. been in the past. Usually in the past, there's always been accusations, but finding any hard, real evidence about it, it's been hard to do, at least hard to do who who created, who created these mass graves? Yeah, that will that won't stop. That won't stop. Uh, the Russians are very sophisticated in uh, uh, falsifying materials too. So it, it's not necessarily going to lead, even with all the additional social media, to clear-cut answers about war crimes. Dr. Thomas Schwartz is our guest. He's a professor at Vanderbilt University in political science and history. Back to continue our conversation about what's going on six months into the Ukraine, Ukraine invasion by Russia. After we watch these messages.